Hello and welcome to another episode of Locked On Wolves. Today on the show, a little bit of a soapbox moment when it comes to the Josh Kroenke news conference from a couple of days ago. I want to break that down a little bit. It's uh, entertaining from a Timberwolves fan's perspective. Also, a couple more NBA mock drafts. And then finally, um, there's a little bit of discussion about could the Brooklyn Nets trade Ben Simmons this offseason? Are the Timberwolves a viable candidate? Once again, we're doing this again. Another offseason, another Ben Simmons trade conversation. It's all coming on the show. Welcome in. You are Locked On Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team Every day. My name is Ben Beek and I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Today's episode is brought to us by Prize Picks. Check out prizepicks.com. Use promo code NBA or go to your app store and download the app today. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Plenty to talk about on the show once again today. A big thank you, first of all, for making Locked On Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, the show is free and available everywhere, including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Apple, Google, Spotify, Odyssey, wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also follow on Twitter at Locked on T-Wolves and at B Beacon. That's with two B's, two E's, C-K-E-N. All right, I want to talk Josh Kroenke, of course, the uh, the president and governor of the Denver Nuggets, among other organizations. Then I want to talk mock drafts. I want to talk uh, Ben Simmons to close the show here today. So let's start with Kroenke. So if you're not familiar, Josh Kroenke is the president. He's the governor of the Denver Nuggets, as well as the Colorado Avalanche. Of course, he's the son of um, of Stan Kroenke, the, it, uh, I guess, infamous, I guess, if you talk to anybody from St. Louis, uh, the the NFL owner that moved the St. Louis Rams to L.A., built that massive, uh, you know, the SoFi Stadium in, in Los Angeles that recently hosted the Super Bowl. Uh, the, just a, essentially owns everything about Denver sports at this point um, or the Nuggets, the Avalanche, also the Colorado Rapids. They own Arsenal, uh, the, the, uh, the soccer team. So um, that's the name. If it sounds familiar and you're not super familiar with the ins and outs of the Denver Nuggets ownership group and their structure, that is essentially his background. That's who he is, right? He hasn't spoken to the media in several years. He came out and gave a press conference a few days ago related to the, the exit of Tim Connolly, of course, hired away by Minnesota to become the president of basketball operations in Minnesota. He had held the same title in Denver and had gotten a promotion a few years ago. Back in 2019, um, uh, Connolly had talked with the Washington Wizards about going to Washington, which would be essentially his hometown team. And the Nuggets decide, you know, they were able to convince him to stay. At the time, you know, Connolly saw this team on the upward trajectory, he was 100% right. It was right before Nikola Jokic became an MVP. He apparently took a little bit less money to stay in Denver than to go be in the front office of his hometown club in the, in the Washington Wizards. And the Nuggets gave him an extension. They gave him, for some reason, an opt-out after three years, which is now. Um, and so that that's kind of setting the stage for this press conference. I, I Like, the, the crunky press conference is insane, though. Um, he literally went up there to to complain about the Timberwolves stealing away Tim Connolly. And despite like interspersing these, hey, congrats to Tim and I'm happy for Tim. And, you know, there were lots of self pats on the back. Like, oh, I hired Tim and people, you know, thought I was crazy because he was unknown. Um, he, he said the exact quote was, I took some flack for hiring an unknown guy named Tim Connolly to come here and work for us. So it's funny to be catching a little bit of flack on the back end with him on the way out. And then later he talks about the same thing. He, he uh, just in a different way about how people are mad that he's hiring people that aren't known. And then they're mad when he lets them leave. It's like, well, okay, that's, that's the job though. Your job is to identify this talent. Um, and, and then your job is to keep the talent. And if you choose to let them leave, you can't complain. And, and that's what he's doing. He's letting th- this talent leave. I mean, my highs, my side, you hear, you go back several years, my, my side, you hear more recently, our tourists um, uh, of the, of the uh, Chicago bulls, their front office. Um, and then now of course, Calvin Booth, obviously running the nuggets. Um, and I don't believe he got a change in, in title, but he's going to be running the front office. So now you've got four teams, in the NBA that are hired or that are run by, um, by executives who were recently or still in Denver. 
Um, and and I guess that's a testament to Kroenke's ability to identify front office talent. But then he can't complain if he's choosing to let them go um, and choosing to not match offers, etc. Um, he mentioned one of the things that that Kroenke mentioned about the uh, about this process is he talked about the offer from the Timberwolves coming in through the side door, which is like like why like why why is that the the perspective here um the Timberwolves requested the ability to talk to Tim Connolly Tim Connolly had an opt out at his contract this year anyway Glenn Taylor this has been reported a long time ago that Mark Lurie and Alex Rodriguez were the ones first interested in hiring Tim Connolly they asked Glenn Taylor to ask the Nuggets which he did he called the Nuggets and said hey we'd like to talk to him so I don't understand why that's the side door that that's not how that that's the exact opposite of that. Um, so that's how that's how uh, Crunky characterized this. And then Crunky also twice called the Timberwolves desperate. He said, um, "Let's see, where's the exact?" He, he said. Uh, uh, by the way, he talked about getting the flack on both ends of of his hires. He again he gets said he was told how dumb he is to hire people. Told how dumb I am to let them go. Ultimately, when you go to a stratosphere that some clubs. You say some desperate clubs are willing to go to. There's a tier out there that just kind of doesn't make sense. And he's referring to the salary as well as the equity, which I'll get to in a second. I don't know why that's... First of all, what a crazy thing to say about another NBA team to call them desperate when they've hired somebody who you're allegedly happy for and you've congratulated and said, oh, I'm happy for him. And then you go and you call the Timberwolves desperate. Doesn't reflect well on anybody involved. Um, and Mike Singer of the Denver Post... Uh, had a funny line in his article, his write-up on the press conference. He said, uh, on the one hand, it could be construed as a swipe at Minnesota. On the other hand, if a team is desperate to win, why is that a negative? Doesn't that indicate a willingness to win at whatever cost, is what Mike Singer said at the Denver Post. That's 100% right. Why is it a bad thing to, to hire the front office talent that you have deemed to be the best fit for your organization and the best chance to get you uh, to make you a perennial playoff contender to get you to the level of, of a championship caliber team. I don't understand how that make why in this regard, like desperate is obviously word choice that makes it, it, it is obviously intended to be a swipe at Minnesota, but at the same time, why is it bad to be desperate to win in the NBA? And then he talks about the equity. He says, quote, the term equity was used a lot the past three weeks with me. It was an interesting conversation to know that that's out there. And I don't know what their deal was, but it was repeated to me through multiple areas that there was some sort of, whether it was equity, whether it was phantom equity, whether it was some sort of valuation upside. I don't know what it is. And then he says, you'll have to ask the Wolves. You'll have to ask Connolly. Well, uh, even if it's not straight equity, and Glenn Taylor basically said in the press conference uh, a little uh, about a week ago, he said, that it was essentially a bonus structure. If the team does well, then Connolly makes more money, which makes sense. Even if it's not true equity, clearly it's something that moved the needle. And if the Nuggets weren't comfortable going, they're fine. I, I, can't we just leave it at that? And, and also the fact that he's talking about not understanding it and he said something to the effect of equity can mean a lot of different things in business. I, that To me, that's a swipe at Tim Connolly and saying basically, well, he doesn't, he doesn't understand it because it, like... In my mind, that's saying that Tim Connolly is doing something he doesn't understand. He's making the wrong decision. Right after, you know, the breath before you said Tim Connolly did a great job uh, in Denver and you're you're happy for him and whatever else. Um, it just is a really sour grapes approach to the whole thing. And and if you don't want to pay him, fine, just say that or, you know, don't say what you said. I guess is, is maybe, I don't, I don't know that he straight up would ever say, yeah, we just didn't want to pay him. But like the, the approach that Kroenke took is really sour grapes. It's really kind of pathetic. If you if you go through and you read uh, the reaction of the Denver media, it's it's basically the same. Like, hey, who does who does this guy think we are? Does he think we're not paying attention here? Um, and it's crazy because the Nuggets have obviously been an extremely successful organization thanks to a lot of the folks that Kroenke has hired. Um, and Calvin Booth, by all accounts, is a fantastic executive. Of course, he was in Minnesota as a player, as a coach, and as an executive. Uh, for a period of time and went to Denver to be their GM and is now running the show with the Nuggets. He's likely to be the next in a long line of really good executives there. So like he could have just taken some additional credit there instead of sour grapes. It goes to show how much this stung and how important Tim Connolly was to Denver. And uh, again, kudos to the Timberwolves and to to Glenn Taylor and, and Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez and, and the front office and ownership group for acquiring uh really acquiring Tim Connolly from the Nuggets. Obviously, there's uh, that stung Denver's franchise uh, on Connolly's way out.
Okay, next I want to talk a couple of mock draft uh, notes that are out there again, and then I want to get to some Ben Simmons conversation. Yes, Ben Simmons' name is a little bit back in the news, and and are the Timberwolves potentially a fit? We'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, first, though, NBA fans, are you looking for a daily fantasy option for the NBA? Then you need to try the award-winning app, Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. I absolutely love the app. I knew you will too. It's super easy to use. You just pick two to five players and an over under on their daily fantasy projections. You can win up to 10 times in any entry. It's just you versus the projected numbers. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's really that easy. You can get the app on either the app store or Google play and it's safe and offers fast withdrawals. It's a variety of options right now during the NBA finals. You can pick any prop or pick from any prop. You can think of points scored rebounds, even steals. Uh, and you can also do a mixed sport entry and you're and by the way, you're not playing against pro DFS players. You're playing against the projected numbers. So you could take Steph Curry steals over and game three of the finals. And if you're also say you're watching baseball, you're a twins fan. You want to take Byron Buxton home runs over, or you want to take, uh, you know, I, I don't know who's pitching, but you want to take like uh, when Joe Ryan's healthy, Joe Ryan strikeouts over. You want to take Steph Curry steals over three pointers made over. You could do that. Price picks doesn't just offer NBA and MLB also uh, in season. You could do college basketball, college football, NFL, soccer, MMA, and more. The cross sport entries are easily the best thing about prize picks for a limited time. Price picks has an exclusive no brainer of an offer for all of our listeners. Listeners get $50 for free. If a player in your first prize picks entry scores a single point, but you must use the code NBA. That's right. This is an exclusive offer available to locked on listeners. Only sign up today. Use the code NBA for $50 for free. If a player in your first prize picks entry scores a single point. Thanks again for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. I have an important ask to you, the listener, an important favor, I should say. We put together a survey so we can learn more about our listeners just like you, make our favorite Lockdown podcast even better. This is your opportunity to tell us what you like and don't like about Locked On. Go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey right now to get started. It doesn't take very long, and everyone that completes a survey can qualify for a chance to win one of 10 $100 Ticketmaster gift cards. To take our audience survey, go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey. Thank you in advance for your help. All right, let's talk NBA mock drafts. We've been filtering in a little bit more mock draft conversation over the past couple of weeks. I spent a couple full shows last week talking NBA prospects. Um, and uh, I mentioned we're getting pretty far down the path now of completing our locked in NBA mock draft uh, as a group. And so that's going to be coming out here soon. Um, and I'm not going to obviously say who I selected in that draft yet or how it's shaking out. But there's a player that I haven't talked about yet on the show that I'm going to talk about soon. Uh, that uh, that is who I ended up selecting at number 19. Of course, the Wolves have the 19th pick. They also have four, excuse me, three picks between 40 and 50 uh, in the second round of this year's draft. And there's been a number of uh, really, if every mock draft you look at has the Wolves taking someone different. And, and a lot of that's because picking 19, I mean, you don't know what's going to be on the board at 19. Obviously, it's very different than, say, the Anthony Edwards here. Obviously, when the Wolves were picking first, and it was basically, hey, do you take Ant? Do you take Lamella Ball? Do you trade down? Now the question is, do you trade up? Do you trade down? Do you stand pat? If you stand pat, who's on the board? And if you look at one mock draft, it'll have the Wolves taking somebody, you look at another, and that player might be going at 31 or he might be going at 10, like literally. I pulled up five different mock drafts and in one will have the wolves taking um, Marjan Beauchamp at 19. Another will have him going at like 12. Another will have him going at like 28. Um, another one, uh, uh, Oshai uh, Ogbaji is another one. Oshai Ogbaji, excuse me, uh, out of Kansas. Same thing. You might see him as a lottery pick. You might see him on the board at 19 for the Timberwolves. Uh, those are guys I haven't talked about. Uh, well, I guess I talked about Beauchamp last week, but there's just a variety. The, Nikola Jovic, another guy, same thing. Any of these names are like they're either going to be there or they're not. Nobody knows at 19, but I but it goes to show this is a fairly deep draft, but there's a lot of these guys who kind of fall into the same bucket. There are it's a lot of uh, three and D guys, a lot of two way players, which is exactly what the Wolves need. Uh, there's less true like fours available on the board in this draft, likely at 19 or guys that could play the four or the five. It's more switchable wing defenders, which are both needs of the Timberwolves. However, to this point, I've really only talked about guys who who do fall into the camp of being more wing players. Um, so I want to talk a little bit today about EJ Liddell 
Um, EJ Liddell of Ohio State is uh, essentially a power forward. The profile, if you watch him, I'll tell you, he reminds me quite a bit of defensively, quite a bit of, of Draymond Green when Draymond was at Michigan State. He's a little bit taller, but he's not quite as long. He's 6'7", six, 6'11", six, wingspan. Draymond's 6'6", six, six with a 7'1", wingspan. Uh, but he fits into that same mold as like, he's not quite the size of a Kavon Looney either, but that that profile that the Golden State Warriors really like of somebody who's maybe a little undersized in terms of height for their position, but is outsized when it comes to their wingspan. He's got the big, the 6'11", wingspan compared to the 6'7", height. But if you watch his tenacity and his um, really kind of ball hawking on defense, uh, you know, chase down blocks, help defense, all that stuff that EJ Liddell did at Ohio State, that's exactly what the Timberwolves want. In fact, think of think of a uh, a bulkier, less athletic version of Jared Vanderbilt in terms of defense. But the offense I'll talk about in a moment is far superior than what Jared Vanderbilt can provide. And I think Liddell, if he's on the board, and, and it, he's another example of somebody that I've seen mocked as high as 11 or 12, and I've seen him mocked as the first pick of the second round. Um, I think I'd be absolutely shocked if he gets to the second round. But there's a chance he's there at 19 for the Timberwolves. And for the reasons I already mentioned, I think his defensive game, the switchability, uh, the defensive IQ, which is off the charts, um, and it's impossible to compare that to, you know, uh, I guess, who's on, who's, um, it's impossible to compare like IQs, but right. We don't, we don't know like what that looks like for some of these guys compared to guys already on the roster and what that looks like in the film room, et cetera. But Jared Vanderbilt's a really intelligent player and understands timing and spacing and, and schemes and all that stuff. Um, EJ Liddell could do the same thing. Um, and again, with maybe a little bit more size, a little bit, uh, the rebounding ability is a bit of a question mark. He was asked to do some different things at Ohio state. He had to do more offensively than he would have to do in the NBA. But the switchability, the versatility, the chase down blocks, the help defense, the defensive IQ, all that stuff is on the same level as Jared Vanderbilt. Um, the, the question for me is rebounding ability. Will that translate to the NBA? Um, but offensively, EJ Liddell can can be a spot up guy. He shot like 37 percent. I believe it was from three at the NBA at the uh, um, at, at in the Big Ten with Ohio State. Yeah, 37 and a half percent from three. Um, average 19 points a game on just a hair under 60% true shooting. And the rebound rate, again, is maybe a little bit lower than you'd like it to be, but it's not bad. Um, so if he could be that spot up guy, you're already looking at somebody who provides more for you than Jared Vanderbilt does um, on the offensive end of the floor. And if the Wolves were to draft a Liddell, he's not going to plug and play in Vanderbilt's spot in the rotation. I don't think you can expect that. If you're going to be a playoff team, you can't draft somebody at 19 and just be like, oh yeah, he'll take Vanderbilt's spot. But Vanderbilt's only got the two years left on his deal. Torian Prince is a free agent. I think Liddell slides right into the Torian Prince type role if they get him at 19, where he's primarily a, I mean, Prince mostly played the three, but he was kind of that three, four hybrid off the bench for Minnesota and was able to play the four in certain schemes. Liddell is more of a four that could, can guard some threes because he's so switchable and could actually play some small ball five, depending on matchups and what happens with Nas Reed down the road. But that's the beauty of Liddell is offensively. He can play the three, the four and the five defensively. He's he's a four that could switch on to threes and fives and be dangerous enough on the perimeter that you're not going to be, you know, you're not going to be completely caught with your pants down if he's stuck in in a rotation or stuck in a in a, a switch on a pick and roll with a guard on the perimeter because he's that good of a defender. He's quick enough laterally. Um, reminds me a little bit. So I, I talked about the the Draymond Green comparison defensively. Offensively, it reminds me a little bit of Paul Millsap and what Paul Millsap turned into, which is the ability to knock down jumpers from really anywhere on the floor. He doesn't really put the ball on the floor and do any damage that way. And he's a good enough passer, he, you know, out of the, out of the high post. Um, he could pass to rollers and cutters, but he's not going to be, you know, you're not going to be running your offense through him, but you don't need to, you have Carl Anthony Towns and you have Anthony Edwards. And for the moment you still have D'Angelo Russell. So all Liddell needs to do is knock down open threes, hit open guys, whether it's cutters or whatever, if he ends up with the ball in the perimeter, which, um, I think he'll be a better passer than Jared Vanderbilt. Um, he's not going to put the ball on the floor and score, but neither does Vando. So I think he does all the things that Vando does really well. Um, in the high motor type guy, all the switchability stuff defensively, chase down blocks, et cetera. I think he'll be a better shot blocker than Vando. And then he brings the ability to stretch the floor, but still not have to be a high usage player. He was obviously high usage with the Buckeyes, but that's because they needed him to be. Um, he's not going to be a high usage guy with Minnesota. Um, so I think it's actually a perfect fit. And he's one of my favorite 
potential selections at 19 for Minnesota. He's even somebody I would consider trading up for if he's on the board, you know, at, at 13, 14, 15. And you think somebody like, uh, you know, the Rockets or might, might take him at 17, or perhaps he could be a fit. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe he's a fit for even like the Hawks at 16. Uh, maybe he's uh, maybe probably not the Hornets at 15, but you never know. Um, and I don't know. I wouldn't be opposed to trading one of those second round picks to go up and get him. I think he's an exact fit for what Minnesota needs. And even if he's a 10, 12, 14 minute a game guy this year, I think he, the role expands quite a bit as we look beyond that, as we look a year into the future, um, when it comes to EJ Liddell. All right, let's close today's show by talking a, a little bit about Ben Simmons. There's once again, a Ben Simmons rumor out there, kind of, sort of, or at least the, the talk that it could happen. So let's talk about that here next. Uh, first, though, let's talk about our friends over at Built Bar. Don't you love a chewy chocolatey brownie? What about a caramel brownie with caramel swirled on top? Delicious. What if I told you you can have all that chewy, chocolatey deliciousness plus just uh, plus 17 grams of protein, not just 17 grams of protein? Your luck because caramel brownie bars are available at Built.com right now. And you got to act fast because they're a fan favorite. Forget about dessert. These are better than dessert. Plus, the macros are unreal. 130 calories, 17 grams of protein, and only four grams of sugar. I would replace a regular brownie with built caramel brownie bar in a heartbeat. The best part is that caramel brownie bars are covered in 100% real chocolate for real. With built, you don't have to sacrifice tasty for healthy. You can have both. And all their bars are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. There are a million reasons why you should try built bars. But for now, let's just say that caramel brownies will absolutely rock your world. And it's not an understatement. With built, tasty is the new healthy. Go to built.com to get your box of caramel brownie bars right now. Built.com promo code locked15 and you'll get 15% off your order. Again, promo code locked15 for 15% off at built.com. All right, let's talk a little bit of Ben Simmons. So there's a Bleacher Report article out there, as there always is. Uh, it's it's the gift that keeps on giving when it comes to uh, potential offseason trade targets. There's a couple of folks over at Bleacher Report that do a great job with this. Grant Hughes is one of them. And so he wrote an article entitled, One No-Brainer Trade Target for Every NBA Team. So he went out and found a player for every NBA team that they should try and target in the offseason. For the Wolves, it's Ben Simmons. Now, this is obviously complicated. Go all the way back to a year ago literally a year ago when there were all the Ben Simmons rumors and it was, it was really prevalent this time of year through like September, really up until Gerson Rosas was fired in September by Minnesota. Then it became less of a, at that point it was like, ah, oh, the wolves are still checking in, but Rosas was the one driving that bus. And of course, Simmons has been, traded from Philadelphia now to, uh, to Brooklyn and a little bit of drama there as well. Brooklyn season didn't go as expected. Who knows what happens with Kyrie Irving at this point, he's likely to opt out. So you've got Kevin Durant, you've got Ben Simmons, and you've got Kyrie Irving, but do you really have Ben Simmons and Kyrie Irving? So if the Nets are already having buyer's remorse when it comes to Simmons, and of course trading James Harden to get Ben Simmons, you know, on the one hand, do you then flip him for less? Do you flip him for parts? Which is essentially what that would be doing, what the Nets would be doing if they traded him to Minnesota. Or do you just cut your losses and say, hey, we don't want to deal with Ben Simmons? If you're the Wolves... I think this only makes sense if you can't trade D'Angelo Russell somewhere and get requisite value back, but you're convinced that you need uh, a lower usage defensive minded player to fit between Carl Anthony Towns and Anthony Edwards. And if you don't think D'Lo is the guy and you can't get, again, you can't get a star back for D'Lo in a trade elsewhere, which I don't think you can, then Simmons might make some sense. Obviously, you've got to worry about the, you know, can he be on the court? Can he stay on the court? The health aspect, the uh, the mental health aspect, and some of the things that have apparently plagued him the past couple of years. Does he want to play in Minnesota? Because as we've seen, he's kind of dictated like he didn't play last year because he didn't want to play. Perhaps he does want to be in a smaller market, a more mid-sized market like Minnesota. Um, so if all that's true, then I think it's worth kicking the tires. It's worth finding out would Brooklyn be interested in in something that we could put together. I don't think it's a D'Lo package, but it could be a D'Lo package. Um, it, it could be a, a something centered around D'Angelo Russell. The salaries actually work. And frankly, it, it would be tough to get Ben Simmons without trading D'Angelo Russell simply from the salary perspective, right? Otherwise, you're really only talking Patrick Beverly's got a $13 million deal and you'd be talking about Malik Beasley's $15.5 million. And together that gets you close, but do you want to trade Patrick Beverly and Malik Beasley and, you know, call it, 
I don't know, probably Bo Morrow or maybe Jared Vanderbilt. Is that really what you want to do to get Ben Simmons? Do you want to trade a starter in Beverly and your sixth man, essentially in Malik Beasley and potentially another starter in Vanderbilt to get Ben Simmons? I don't know. I also don't know that the Nets would be too excited to do that. The point that Grant Hughes makes over at Bleacher Report is that Brooklyn, the package of role players would get Brooklyn's attention. It would be hard. He says it wouldn't be hard to imagine Malik Beasley, Jared Vanderbilt, Jade McDaniels, and even Patrick Beverly playing significant minutes for the Nets next season. On the one hand, that's true because what do you need around Kevin Durant? You need solid role players, and all those guys are that. Actually, Malik Beasley would be a great fit with Brooklyn. Actually, I think Jared Vanderbilt would too. On the other hand, it's a, it's it's are you trading? Or do you really want to tr cash in a star player in Ben Simmons for multiple role players? I also don't know that Minnesota, like Minnesota had a lot of depth last year, but all of a sudden you've completely, it's it's completely gone. If you trade four guys for Ben Simmons and is Ben Simmons that guy? Um, I've actually been more in the camp of getting Ben Simmons than not getting Ben Simmons. Uh, like going all the way back a year, I, I'm willing to admit I was on the front lines of like, hey, trade what you can that's not tied down. Trade anybody besides Towns and Anthony Edwards because Ben Simmons is such a synergistic fit with Towns and Edwards. That was my that was my position all along. Um, and it looks a little silly now, given how terrible last year went for Ben Simmons. And by that, I mean, he did nothing last season. But I still think the version of Ben Simmons that was an all-star, was, was a, a, a top 25 player in the league just a couple of years ago, is the absolute perfect fit with Ant and Cat. And if you could do it, I wouldn't trade Jaden McDaniels at this point. A year ago, I absolutely would have. I wouldn't now. I, I think that what McDaniels could do this year is probably, um, I think the upside, the ceiling there is still probably about where Simmons has been, honestly. Uh, I think the ceiling is very similar. So I don't think you trade McDaniels, but if you could do it for Beasley and Vanderbilt and you got to find another salary match, you know, if they do it for D'Lo, I, I would absolutely consider that trade because the Simmons fit is still so perfect. And I know there's lots of other things to consider in terms of the, uh, can he stay on the court and all, all the other stuff. Um, but from a pure basketball perspective, it would be really hard to not seriously consider making that deal. Okay. That's all we have for you today here on the show. Thanks once again for listening to lockdown wolves and for making us your first listen every day. Of course you can listen everywhere, including YouTube, Apple, Google, Spotify, Odyssey, anywhere you listen to podcasts. You can also follow on Twitter at lockdown T wolves and at B beacon with two B's, two E's, C-K-E-N. Thanks again for listening to Lockdown Wolves, of course, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. And uh, also a reminder, you can make your second list in the Lockdown NBA Big Board. It's the best time of year to listen to the NBA Big Board. Host Raphael Barlow from NBA Draft Junkies and author of the NBA Big Board newsletter is joined by Richard Stamen, Sam Ferris, and Leif Thulin, giving fans an in-depth look into the NBA draft, mock drafts, player rankings, and of course, big boards. It's free and available wherever you listen to podcasts. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.